So if you all please welcome. <laughs> I think I'll probably wander around because I feel like I'm really short <laughs> with this light that I don't think I need either. Um, and the mic doesn't work or I would use it, but it blew a fuse before I came two weeks ago, <laughs> apparently. Um, I want to thank Mike Bontempo for organizing this and, and um, I was president of Our Friends of the Library on Nantucket for about 10 years, from about 1990 to um, 2000. It's a lot of work. It was wonderful, though. I had so much fun. And now I get together with my friends, and we're all saying, oh, the good old days, you know? <laughs> and um, we presented a lot of programs, which was more of a challenge on Nantucket than it is here, because how many of you have been to Nantucket? Oh, so you almost, yeah, all right. Have you ever uh, not been able to get back? Have you ever been there when there's been fog or gale force wind or, or the sound froze over, the harbor froze over? Um, we've had, we did have, we still have many programs that are, um, postponed because of weather on Nantucket. It's, it's very much a part of our lives. Um, and the library is very much part of our lives on Nantucket, too. Um, I've lived there on Nantucket for 30 years. Um, and I thought I'd talk a little bit about how the island, Nantucket, has influenced my life. Um, because um, I think I called this Nantucket Notes when, when Mike asked what the title would be. And I thought, people are interested in what it's like living there year round. That's what we say, year round. And, um, and it is interesting. That's one word for it. Having just been through this winter um, on Nantucket, um, it's been very interesting. When I first met Charlie, and I'll come back to that, um, in 1980, oh dear, two, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, tax season, you know, the numbers just start running crazy in your head, or at least they do in mine. Um, back then, the island was quite different, and we got all our electricity, and we still do, from the Cape, but we got it I don't know how we got it, before they ran an underground cable, which they've done, not underground, underwater cable. So we now have an underwater cable, which means the electricity doesn't go out quite as often as it used to, but it still does go out a lot, as does Comcast, Verizon, TV, phone, um, but, but the electricity is the hardest thing. It's, it's um, hard for, especially families with little children, it's, it's hard for a writer, um, and it's challenging. Uh, so I want to talk about that a little bit, too, and I also want to talk about my book. So I have a lot of things to talk about, but what I'd really like to do is talk for about 15 minutes and then take questions, because I really enjoy answering questions from people. Um, I've written for 30 or 35 years now. I've been published that long. I've written 24 books. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> And um, a lot of people say to me, you really are, are disciplined. And I want to say to them, no, I'm really sort of like OCD, you know, like obsessed. And Charlie can vouch for that. If I'm writing, I'm happy. All I ever wanted to do was write books. I never, ever wanted to do anything else. When I was a little girl, I started reading when I was four. And, and then there, there was this time period when I didn't realize that it was human beings who wrote books. You know, they were just, they were, they were there, they existed. 
And this was in Wichita, Kansas, where I grew up. And um, every Saturday, my mother would take me and my brother and sister to the library. We went to the library and to the grocery store. And I just assumed everybody in the world did this. You got your groceries and you got your books. This is life. This is how you live. And I wanted to write books. Um, it took me a long time to discover my voice, to discover my topic, what I wanted to write about. Because growing up in Kansas, one of the things I wanted to do was to be wild. Um, I don't know if you can remember being a teenager. Uh, I don't know if you ever wanted to be wild, um, but I did, and I kind of was a little tiny bit, and I survived it. Um, and when I started writing, though, the women writers that I knew about um, were either really wild, and I didn't want to be that wild, or um, they were unmarried, or they were married but childless. Um, I got a master's in literature from UMKC without ever having to read one woman writer. And I got my master's in 1964. Or maybe it was 66, 1966. They didn't have me read Virginia Woolf or Willa Cather or Emily Dickinson. They didn't talk about Jane Austen. They didn't talk about Emily Bronte. No women were mentioned. But I read these women, um, and I sort of, there was sort of this schizophrenic thing going on, which was there were either literary women writers, like Virginia Woolf, or there were romance writers. And um, my mother always took Red Book magazine. I don't know if you all remember Red Book. But my, my desire in life was to have something published in Red Book. And I, was, I really wanted to do that. But I still didn't know what my subject was. Um, and then I had children. And as soon as I had children, I knew what I wanted to write about. Only I didn't have the time to do it. <laughs> um, but somehow, I made the time to do it because Virginia Woolf was married, but she didn't have children. I don't think Jane Austen was ever married. Uh, Willa Cather, I could go through Emily Dickinson. They were never married, they never had children. Um, and there was Dorothy Parker, who I kind of wanted to be like because she was really wild. Um, but I really didn't want to be like her, really, because she also kind of scared me. And she was depressing, and I was like, I mean, she was depressed. I think she was probably chronically depressed. She was certainly funny in her depression, but I didn't want to be depressed. So it took me a long time to realize that what I wanted to write about was being what I call an ordinary woman, meaning a woman who has a family, and once I got into that, I, I have gone down a road that will never end, um, because families, I think, are the core of the universe. I think they were the heart of the world. I think the family we come from, our sisters, our brothers, our uncles, our grandparents, and then if you have children, and then if you have grandchildren, um, it's so complex and it's so, it's so confusing, um, it's so magical, it's so bizarre. <laughs> um, and that's what I have written about uh, during my lifetime and what I continue to write about and uh, what I love writing about. Um, when I moved to Nantucket, I sort of developed, I sort of added on another part to my theme of families, and that is houses. I love houses. I, I'm fascinated by houses. And maybe part of this is because 
on Nantucket, there is this season, this winter season, when most people, a lot of people, leave the island. And the island's changed a lot now, so that even in the downtown core district, most of the houses are empty. But in some houses, at night, people are there. And I love to walk. I love to go for a walk. I am not a peeping Tom. I will not come look in your window. But, but I, I love to walk along on a snowy, cold night or a windy night or a sunny day anytime and look in a window and see a family, see this golden glow of a light, um, see people walking and, and talking. And the other thing I love to do to switch from winter to summer is this. Charlie and I have a house on Orange Street, which is the main street out of town. It's from Main Street out to the airport, if you need to get to the airport. And it's a nice um, 1840s uh, Greek Revival house, very tall. And it's on the corner of a little tiny narrow street called Flora. And um, it's not very far from town. And our kitchen is right on the corner of Orange and Flora. And in the summer, we have the windows open because our house isn't centrally air conditioned. Um, and so a lot of people bike up the hill, bike up Flora Street to Orange Street, or walk along Orange Street, and they get lost, and they get upset with one another. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and they might be people who have bought beautiful clothes from, um, Brooks Brothers, Abercomb I can't pronounce that place, you know what I mean. Um, and they've come here to be beautiful people. They might even own one of the houses that costs $10 million because you can buy a house for $10 million and that's not even the most expensive one on the island. And um, they'll be walking along or they'll be driving and they'll get lost and they'll start arguing. <laughs> and I love it. I'm in there fixing dinner and I, I kind of, every now and then, I've never done this, but I think, you know, wouldn't it be funny just to lean out the window and say, having fun, <laughs> enjoying our island. Um, houses are where people live and they're, they're the, they contain so much emotion. They contain so much. In our house, we've lived there for 30 years. Uh, I can remember having Christmas Eve parties for years and years and years and years with friends of several ages who have already departed the earth. Um, I can remember the sound of doors slamming when our children were teenagers. And that wasn't fun. Um, I can remember when Charlie's mother, who was very ill, lived in the house with us for a while. I can remember when my mother, who came from Kansas City, uh, came every summer for about a month and stayed with us. She had a little apartment in the basement. It, it's a English basement, so she had her own door out and she had windows. It's, we didn't keep her in the cellar. Uh, <laughs> and um, I would always plant pansies all around for her to see. So the house is full of memories. Everybody's house is full of memories and also full of mysteries. And for a writer, it's just, it's just gold. Um, here are two of the books. This is a CD of my last book, Island Girls, which I put up here. I'm going to go on a little side tangent. There's a friend of mine in the audience named Elena Murphy. Some of you might know her. And she makes these beautiful bags. And I met her because she reads my books. She's so smart. <laughs> and, and she gave me, this is one of the books she gave me. It has so many pockets. I sound like I'm, I'm your, your ad person. Anyway, did you, did you ever notice that? Yeah. That's yeah. Right. I just your 
Oh, you did. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> um, Island Girls is about three sisters who have the same father, but um, three different mothers. And this is not that uncommon in this day and age. This is pretty common. Um, and it's about how the father knows when he's dying that the three girls have all hated each other as much as they've loved each other. Well, I think you can have the same father and the same mother and still hate your sister as much as you love her. I mean, don't tell my sister I said that, but um, he leaves them the house with the qualification that they have to live together for one summer um, in order to inherit the house. And that's what Island Girls is about. Um, one of the interesting things to me is that last year when I was talking about it at various places, I said um, one of the problems, and it's a real problem on Nantucket, is that houses have now become so valuable, not because they're a fabulous house, but because they're on Nantucket, that let's say the father, the mother, the parents die, and three siblings inherit a house, and two of them want to keep the house for the summer for their grandchildren, their children, because they've always come there. But one of them wants the money. Because how could you not be tempted to have one third of $10 million? I mean, you could come rent a place on the island. Um, and I was talking about that in a bookstore on the Cape, and two women raised their hands later and said, we just came from Nantucket where we just sold our house because our brother didn't ever want to come there. He wanted the money. Mm -hmm. um, so this sort of thing, I, I wanted to say, well, how are you and your brother now? Are you going to talk to each other again? I mean, what, what kind of that? Think of that. There's so much drama with families and houses. Um, Summer Breeze is a book that's not set on Nantucket. It's set in um, an area near Northampton, Mass. And I don't know if you all know that area called the Pioneer Valley. Um, and one of the reasons I set this book here, and you can understand what my writing is about and my book is about, uh, my daughter is married, and she and her husband and our grandchildren live out there. So I kept going out and going out, and I thought, this is a really beautiful area. I mean, Massachusetts is a gorgeous state. And, and there was a lake there called Lake Wyola. And we would take the kids there to go swimming. And it's beautiful. And um, I thought, I want to set a book here, too. So I did. And this book is about um, several things. And here is one question that really interests me, because I see this happening in my, my daughter's 38, in her, her age group. What happens if you love, you fall in love with a guy, he proposes, and he wants to move to San Francisco, where he has a wonderful job, but you want to stay near your parents. You want to stay where your parents can see your grandchildren, play with your grandchildren, babysit your grandchildren, where you can be part of that life. Um, how do you choose? That's a, I think that's a hard choice. Um, one of the young women here is happily married, and um, she has a two-year-old son, but she happens to have a job she just loves. And I stole the job from my other son-in-law, who is a biohazard safety expert, which is something that didn't even exist when I started writing. Um, he is now the director. I'm sorry if I'm driving you crazy, OK? Um, <laughs> he's the director. David's the director of, of safety management at Arizona State University. 
and that means he knows all about anthrax. He knows all about, he knows about the plague. He was at the University of New Hampshire when I went up and said, would you, I said, would you show me about your, your work? And um, David and um, the professor were the two people in the University of New Hampshire who had the special key card to go into the lab where the plague cells were kept. And David said, come in, I'll show you. And I was like, well, thanks, but no. <laughs> and um, actually, I did go in. Um, he has also taken me, he was at Harvard for a while, so I got, uh, I got to see the morgue at Harvard. Um, <laughs> and I've never been in a morgue before, and that was interesting. Um, and that's kind of, in, that is interesting because there are all these tunnels. Did you know that in Boston underground? Like, it's really cool. Um, anyway, that's what Summer Breeze is about. It's about three women who are trying to balance love and work. That's Summer Breeze. Quickly, I want to mention one more thing. My daughter is a novelist. I'm very proud of her. Her name is Samantha Wild. She also went to Yale Divinity School. She also went to Kripalu, and she teaches yoga. Um, and she now has three and a half children. <laughs> and she's obviously young and has a lot of energy. And she's written two books. The first one was called This Little Mommy Stayed Home because that's what she's done. When she met her husband, they were talking about life and how they would like life to be. And they both decided when the kids are little, the mommy should stay home. And he has tenure at UMass Amherst, thank you. And um, so he can support the family. And she wrote that book, and then she wrote this book called I'll Take What She Has, which is about married envy. I don't know if you can remember being young and married and, and thinking that your best friend's house or car or something is better than yours, or then, then some, they grow up and some kid goes to Harvard and your child goes to, I don't know, uh, Tibet. And um, uh, so this is about married envy. But now she's taking a little break from writing, I'm happy to say. Um, do you have any questions? Do you want me to talk any more about a writer's routine on Nantucket? What it's like to live on Nantucket? Um, I've always had a routine that I stick to. Uh, and again, it's because of my children. When my children were little, I would get up, get them dressed, they would go to school, and I would go in and sit down and write. And I didn't get dressed. I mean, I had on pajamas. or a <laughs> <laughs> I had on a robe. I had on sweatpants and a sweatshirt, something. But I didn't get dressed. I didn't comb my hair. I didn't make my bed. I didn't make my children's bed um, beds. I, I, I knew that if I, if I got dressed, I would think, well, I really should exercise, and I've really got to do a load of laundry. And if I started doing anything around the house, you know how that just leads on and on. So I've always gotten up, got my coffee, gone to work. And uh, I work from um, 7 or 5.30 in the winter. Whenever the sun starts, there's a little bit of light in the sky. I, I wake up, and I'm ready to go. Until about, uh, until about noon or two. Um, I don't have lunch with friends, except in the summer I tend to have lunch with friends because more people come to the island. Um, I've done this for a long time, and I really love doing it. Um, my daughter likes writing books, but she prefers teaching yoga. She is a substitute minister at several churches in the Hadley area uh, because she likes being around people. I think writers have an infinite amount of, of desire for being alone. 
I, I could be alone for a long time. I prefer being alone with my husband somewhere in the house, and he prefers being alone with me in the house, and we sort of pass each other now and then, hello. And uh, um, I, I, I like to write, I love to write, um, and I love to read, and I have stacks of books, and this is another reason that Charlie and I get along so well because we're always reading. We always have lots of books to read and we're always talking about our books. Um, I would say we have a very satisfactory life. Um, we have friends on the island who also write. And we had dinner, was it last night? Just last night? I don't know if you know Nat Philbrick's books. He wrote Into the Heart of the Sea. He just came out with a book called Bunker Hill, which is, he's a historian. And Into the Heart of the Sea is being made into a movie by Ron Howard. And, and the guy who plays Thor, Chris Helmsworth or Hemsworth, is starring in Into the Heart of the Sea. And, and Nat lives about two blocks away from us and we've known them for a, lot of, a long time. There are a lot of people who are painters or musicians if you like solitude, if you can deal with solitude, um, and you're not an alcoholic, uh, <laughs> it's really good to be on Nantucket in the winter. It's, to me, it's the richest, most delicious time. I just love it because I can, I can go to the library. Our library has lots of events. It has a lot of, of lectures come over, um, it has movies, um, it has knitting classes, it has all sorts of things. Um, we only have one movie, well we do have two, we have a little tiny, we have a movie theater smaller than this room and I don't go there anymore because the projection, the projector always breaks down. So now we, the Dreamland, which is our big, beautiful, newly renovated, um, theater is working again. So we, but we live on an island, so they might say, okay, we're going to have um, 12 years a slave next week, except there might be gale force wind, and then the airplanes can't get here, and then the mail can't get here, and, and then the boats can't get here, so maybe it'll be here on Monday, or maybe it'll be here a week from Monday. So we have to be sort of flexible in our uh, choice of entertainment in the winter. You have to be ready to stay home um, and read by candlelight <laughs> because that does happen a lot. Um, I walk a lot, Charlie walks a lot. We're really concerned with nature. And the book I have coming out this summer, which is called Nantucket Sisters, uh, is partly about the way the island has changed, which to me, Nantucket is sort of a microcosm of the world, of the United States. There is more and more emphasis on having a big grand house than on just having a smaller house and letting the land be there because the land has been there for a long time and there are other creatures who live on it. Um, when I wrote this book, my editor who lives in New York and who, um, and I have a friend of my agent here, so I have to be very careful what I say, but <laughs> my agent grew up on Nantucket, so she understands how I feel. Um, we're seeing a lot of changes on the island, especially the way it's going toward um, not citification, but glitzification. I don't know what the word is. We used to, like, there's no friends of the library anymore. I used to be on the board of the library of the Nantucket Athenaeum. I couldn't be on the board of the library now because I don't have enough money. You, if you've got, well, Tommy Hilfiger's moved away, but he's somebody who, who did live there. Um, there are people who live there who have Oh, well, Wendy Schmidt, whose husband is Mr. Google, um, Eric Schmidt. Wendy has moved to the island, and 
she has an infinite, she has billions, not just millions, and the joke on the island is the billionaires are running out the millionaires. <laughs> that changes the island. It's changed all of the nonprofit groups so that now I could volunteer, and I do some volunteering, but I don't volunteer for the library because they just pay somebody to do what the friends used to do which is a shame because then you don't feel as connected with your community. You don't feel as, I mean, when, when I was on the board of the Friends and I was also on the board of trustees and there were, I think we had 20 on our board of the Friends, we had, it was just wonderful. We had, we felt so much in touch with young people, old people, rich people, poor people, uh, immigrants, uh, people who'd, lived, whose families came over on the Mayflower. I mean, um, it, was, it was a much more all-inclusive feeling, and I miss that a lot. And I got off the subject of, of being a writer on Nantucket. Do you have any questions? Yes. Well, you said that uh, family and homes is very time and fast. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting that you would ask this. She asked about the, fam the houses that are falling into the ocean on Nantucket. My husband's very much involved with something called Coastal Conservancy. Um, the families that own the homes on the ocean are people we do not know because they live in Germany, I'm not kidding you, or they live it's, it's just one of their houses, just one of their houses. I cannot tell you how many houses there on, are on the island that cost $10 million or more, and it's a place where they might come for two weeks a year. And in the meantime, they, they at least paid landscapers. I mean, the people have jobs because they have to, and the house cleaners and so on go clean the house when nobody's there. Um, when I first moved there, I did know people who had a house, who had houses on the bluff. And um, in fact, I have written, oh, it's interesting, I forgot about that. I was thinking about what's going on now. Um, heat wave. Heat wave is about a woman who has a big, beautiful house on the bluff overlooking Nantucket Sound, and she's widowed and she turns her house into a B&B. &B. Mm -hmm. And I had a wonderful time writing this, and of course, later on I thought, okay, here you go, you're just making it into, you know, come in and be part of my family. But the house, in my mind, led itself to that. I don't think there is a B&B &B or a house anywhere on any shore of our island where you can stay, where it's a hotel or a B&B. &B. Um, but I'm still going to set houses there and set my novels there um, because I love, the, I love looking out at the ocean. And I think for people who come and who walk on the beach, it gives you some way of thinking, reflecting. They, scientifically, they say there are ions that do something to you that make you less depressed, that open you up. Um, I, think, I think it's a healing place. I think it's a wonderful place for friends to come. A lot of women will come in, say, November, which is a sort of a gray time, and they'll rent a house for a week, and they'll eat it, they'll just eat and eat and eat at restaurants and go for walks on the beach and get, you know, sand in their hair and it's all wonderful and they'll talk about their husbands and their children and their, what they should have done and what they're gonna do and it's just, it's just wonderful. Um, but as for houses right on the beach, um, I don't think I've been in one for a while and I don't expect I ever will, yeah, yes. Do your characters take on a 
uh, personality all themselves by going off into different directions, or is this all planned ahead? That's a good question, and it's something that's changed in my life. When I first started writing, I, I never knew what the end was going to be. I started with a character. I started with a person. Um, by the way, I should say all my books are available as e-readers now. And how many of you have a Kindle or a Nook? Can I just see? I'm curious. OK. Um, it's, it's exciting for me that my early books are now available at least as e-readers. Um, and my early books, I did start with a character. For example, there was a, the, a book I wrote called Nell, which I wrote because I had met Charlie. I had come to the island to visit a friend, and I met Charlie. And then I rented a cottage there for a month in the summer, and I thought, I'm going to write a book about a woman who comes to the island for the summer, and I did. Um, but I didn't know what was going to happen to her until the end. Now I'm at the point in my life where I am so fortunate because my editor said last year, would you please, do you think you could write a Christmas book set on Nantucket? Just a little gift book. And um, I said, yeah, I can do that. And I had to write a synopsis. It was only like a hundred and... 80 pages. Do you have a copy of it? Ah, well, aren't you wonderful? <laughs> Thank you. I will sign it to Rose. For Rose, it's called um, A Nantucket Christmas. And it has a dog in it. And it, in fact, part of it is from the dog's point of view. And uh, it starts off with the dog being abandoned on the moors. And do you know, I got email from people saying, how could you do that to that dog? And I thought, it's a book. And I, <laughs> I, did, I wouldn't abandon a dog. And then I got, I do a lot on Facebook. I love Facebook. I love the connection. So a lot of people said, you have cats. We know because we've seen pictures of them. And how, what do your cats think of the fact that you wrote a book with a dog in it? <laughs> so I said to my editor, okay, I'm going to write another Christmas book, and it's going to have a cat in it. And that's going to come out this year, and it's going to be called Christmas on Chestnut Street. Um, and that, to come back to your question, I had to plot very carefully because now I'm writing two books in one year, and I really do love to write. I'm very happy doing this, but I need to be a little more organized so I know exactly what's happening with the Christmas book. And with the other books, I'll tell you, I'm writing in a category now that a lot of people call beach books. I don't know if you've heard that. And by beach book, I think they mean it's not too literary. It's not going to, to be something that really makes you think a lot. There's not going to be famine or abused children or people dying in Africa or torture. Um, and probably there will be a happy ending. So. When I got sort of put in that category, I thought, well, that's what I write anyway. I, don't, I, I write about families. I, I try to deal, and in many of my books, I have dealt with very difficult subjects. I've written about a child with cystic fibrosis. I've written about a divorce and custody case. I've, I've written about many serious issues, but I think I'm an optimist, and I think there usually is a way to work things out. And I think, um, I think that's, that's the message that I want to give. So I know when I start writing a book, I know the character, and I know, I know sort of where she's going.
I might spend too much time writing about the house she lives in, and then I have to get rid of those. I just, I don't include those, those um, pages in my book. Um, for the book that I'm writing for a year from now, which is going to be called The Guest Cottage, house again, um, I, know, I know the plot. So I think I've become a little more organized, um, and maybe it's just the way my mind works, that, that as I get older, things are happening a little more, I don't know, in many ways I'm not becoming more organized, so. <laughs> uh, does that answer your question? Yes, you have a question. Um, I'm gonna answer that, well, I, no, I'll start from the beginning. I was 30, Four when my first book was accepted, but my first short stories were accepted when I was in my 20s. But I spent a lot of time, as I said, trying to find my voice. So I spent a lot of time, I tried to write romance novels. I tried to write experimental novels where I didn't use capitalization and people did weird things to each other, and it freaked me out. And I, I, um, but I would send them to literary reviews and they would get rejected. Um, it took me a long time of writing every day. I would say 10 or 15 years, because I was teaching, I was traveling, um, then I had children, then I got divorced. Um, I got divorced the same year my first book came out. And actually, it was fabulous. Uh, <laughs> I was so glad to be divorced, and I was so glad to have my book come out uh, that what I did, because I had decided I was sophisticated, was to start smoking, because I thought writers smoke, except that I can't. It really doesn't make me feel good. So I stopped that after a while. Um, I sent my book to an agent. I sent a book to an agent when I was about 30. And he sent it around to editors, and I got a number of very nice um, rejection letters, and it was rejected. Um, then I sent him Stepping, and Doubleday published it, and, and that was it. It was wonderful. Um, but I want to say to everybody here, because I have friends and my daughter who are, who are interested in publishing novels and writing novels. I don't know if any of you have read the novels of Joan Medlicott. If you haven't, get them from the library. Joan Medlicott. The Ladies of Covington Send Their Love. That was her first novel. It was published when she was 65. Her first novel was published when she was 65. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and she's now, I think she's about 80 now. Um, she's published at least seven novels. She was written up in ARP magazine, a picture of her. She lives in South Carolina, or is it North Carolina? She lives in Asheville wherever that is, I've gone down and visited her, I've stayed with her, I've, I've, she's a wonderful, charming lady who did many other things before she started writing. But she wrote The Ladies of Covington Send Their Love, and she wrote a series after that about these three women, because what they do is that they're all, let's say, 60 and older, they're either widowed or divorced, they're, they're in good enough shape they don't want to go to an old folks' home, so the three of them buy a house together and live together. Here we go, families and houses. No wonder, I, I gave her a quote, she asked me, and I, we immediately became friends. Um, and her book is wonderful, and, and it was published when she was 65, and, and she kept on going. Um, I don't know if any of you read P.D. James, who is a mystery writer. Her last book came out, I think, a couple of years ago when she was 90. Did you know that? She was 90. Uh, dame P.D. James, I like to say, because she has been made a dame of the British Empire. You can write, no matter how old you get, 
It's, it's, not, it's not age. In fact, I think you get better. And I also want to say, you can also self-publish. Another writer, Lisa Genova, who lives on the Cape, still Alice, still Alice. It's about a woman who, is, who has early onset Alzheimer's. Lisa published this book online before she sold it. She published it without an agent. Don't tell Meg I said this. And then a publisher approached her, and it's just been made into a movie with Alec Baldwin, Joanna, what's her name, Moore, hmm? and Kristen Stewart, who's that vampire girl. And, um, uh, and, and her life has changed. So I would say, just do it, just, but get online, get on Facebook, get on, read things. Um, if you want to write, I would say read. One of the answers is that Charlie, my husband, grew up in Cambridge, Mass. He does not say he grew up in Boston. His mother grew up in Boston, but Charlie grew up in Cambridge. So I used to travel up to Boston with Martha, and then I would come to Cambridge with Charlie. And <laughs> the first place Charlie ever took me off island, we met on Nantucket in November. I think in January, when, when we came, he came to Williamstown, uh, the first place he took me was to Mount Auburn Cemetery. <laughs> yeah. Now, a lot of people would say, oh, how nice he took you to a cemetery. Um, but he also took me to Forest Hill Cemetery. He also took me to, I don't know the name of the cemetery out in Stockbridge, but there's something called the Sedgwick Pie, um, where Edie Sedgwick and her strange family, I'm sorry, is buried. Um, Charlie and I love statuary. We love, I mean, Mount Auburn and Forest Hills. The, the flowers, the trees, the bushes, the shrubs, and the statuary, it's, I think cemeteries are outdoor museums. They're just, they're, I just love walking through them, and I love reading the, uh, I love, I mean, E.E. E. Cummings, is, is, is he buried at Forest Hills, Charlie? Yeah. Um, I, I just love cemeteries, and so does Charlie. So the book that you're reading, Custody, was a very hard book to write, and a very, because it's about a divorce case. And to do that, I came up, fortunately I have a good friend, I have several friends who live in Boston, and I stayed with them, and I went to um, the probate and family court in Cambridge and introduced myself to some of the judges. This was quite a few years ago before the internet, but I spent a week sitting in on divorce cases in the family and probate court and listen to the sides argue and, and listen to the judge make her decision. And then afterwards, she might say, this is why I did this. She never talked about the cases, but she would say, this is the one thing that, that tipped it and it would be something that I wouldn't have noticed. Um, I think it's necessary to do a lot of research and and not just to do it on the internet. I think it's good to go there. I think it's good to stand in the room. I, I, when I wrote Between Husbands and Friends, which is about a child with cystic fibrosis, I went to a uh, children's hospital, and I went to the, uh, I wanna say pulmonary, is that right? Pulmonary uh, section, and talked to this formidable woman who really frightened me, and you probably know her, Elena, but, um, <laughs> But she was very kind, and she gave me information. I find that people like to talk about their work. They're, th no matter what they're doing, it's interesting, and they're proud of it. And I've never had somebody say, no, I don't want to tell you what I do. Go away. I think, I think, and I think there's always something that adds to the richness of it if you go to the place. Um, I had an agent... When I first started, uh, a friend of a friend gave me the name of a man named Julian Bach, and I just wrote to him. I was in my late 20s. I had published 
And this helped a lot back then. I don't know if it would help now. I had published several um, short stories in serious literary reviews in various countries. And, and that, if you want to get a book published, it helps if you've written a column for a newspaper, if you've written a newsletter for an organization, something that shows an agent that you're capable of, that you know what a period is, that you know something about basic grammar. Um, I wrote to him, he wanted to see my book, and he took me on. And we were together for quite a while, and then he got old and passed his agency over to another woman, and we just didn't get each other. Um, and for a long time, there, there still is, uh, there's a wonderful woman who's now my agent, Meg Rooley, who grew up on Nantucket and who's a literary agent in New York. And she has a client named Laura Simon, who is also a writer, um, and who wrote a book called Dear Mr. Jefferson, Letters from an American Gardener, because she has a garden bigger than this room where she grows her own vegetables. Um, and Laura would say to me, you really ought to meet Meg. You would really like Meg. And maybe I ran into Meg at parties. And maybe um, I thought about Meg. Um, and then one day, um, I wrote a book, or I started writing a book. And I really loved this book. And I wrote a series of books called The Hot Flash Club. I don't know if any of you, OK? And, um, so I wrote The Hot Flash Club, which, and there are four books, and they're not like any of my other books, and they're really funny, and I don't know where they came from, but I told my agent about them, and she was probably 40 and I was probably 50 or something, and, and I think it sort of creeped her out to think <laughs> that, that, that you would ever, that, you know, and she, she just couldn't get excited, and my current editor was totally not excited. And I thought, I'm, these people are just so dishwashy and, no, I don't mean that, I mean wishy-washy. Um, and uh, so I called Meg and I said, Meg, and I talked to her a little bit and I said, I have this book called The Hot Flash Club. And she burst out laughing and you know Meg's laugh. And from that point on, it's, it's been a wonderful relationship. And she's younger than I am, so. Uh, I think we can stay together for a long time. Um, I read mysteries mostly. I'm, I love mysteries. I'm a mystery fiend. Um, but I force myself to read a nonfiction book every so often. And I really love nonfiction books. I love books by, and now I can't think of his name. Uh, well, I'm reading a book now called The President's Club which is absolutely fascinating. It's, it's nonfiction. It's about, I, I didn't know this, the presidents of the United States, after their presidents, they all get together in a president's club and they talk about issues and they advise the current president on issues and they, they disregard political lines of Republican, Democrat, and so on and think what is the best for the country and what is the best for the presidency because they believe it's the presidency's power that has kept our country strong. So I've gotten, I think I, it started with maybe Hoover or yeah, with Hoover and I've gotten up to Nixon. So I've gone through, that's a really fascinating book. But then I always, a new mystery will come out and I'm gone. I, I'm just like, okay, that's enough, that's enough, yeah. Well, it's been an hour, and it's been a wonderful hour, and I love seeing all your faces. And I have a question. Can I take a picture of you for Facebook? Would you mind? <laughs> you, no, it's going to be like from back here, so you won't see if you have, I mean, it won't show if you have lipstick on or not. <laughs> if I can find my camera. I love Facebook, yes. You can, yes, be my friends on Facebook. Oh, I love this. Let's see if I had, I probably had it set on video or something. I'll do one more. Thank you.
<laughs> Thank you.